Hey, what's going on guys? David Avalon here with Robert Drysdale and we're in our fourth episode of Breaking the Guard. Um, we've been gone for a bit. Just jumping back in. We're actually both in Costa Rica. Recently just got back. Yeah, yeah. So awesome how was that time. like? Awesome time down there. I'm considering getting rid of my gym, getting rid of all jiu-jitsu, buying a fishing boat, moving to Tamarindo, Costa Rica. <laughs> And just fishing for a living. What a life, man. It's a beautiful thing. It's really nice. Yeah, actually, yeah. I got to go there before Rob, and <laughs> I was there for like three weeks. Beautiful country. Uh, we both went to the same place, though, the yeah. Hero Academy, yeah. uh, which is also a charity that helps uh, the kids there. They train them for free, and there are amazing kids there. So shout and, out to Ron Jarman out of Hero Academy and Rome Za. Thank you, Ron, for the hospitality. And, and safe place, too. Yes. Like I went down there, I never, like I grew up in Brazil, so I have like the alarms go off very easy, you know, in certain areas. I just I kind of like, okay, this is not, I'm in danger here. Kind of, you just feel that, you know, yeah, you're sure. in a, like a heavy neighborhood and you don't want to, you know, you don't feel safe. But uh, Costa Rica, I never felt that. Like I felt safe the whole time. It was very, very American friendly. Like a lot of people speak English. So yeah, recommended. Oh, yeah, especially that area we're at where the Tamarindo, it's like a beach town, yeah. a very small beach town, yeah. literally one dirt road that goes around it. So. I feel like there were as many, as many Americans and Canadians who moved there to live as Costa Ricans. I yeah. feel like the population was like 50-50. <laughs> That's probably why so many people speak English. Well, they have actually favorable tax laws for foreigners because they're yeah. trying to get foreign investment. Yeah. So I think they pay very, very like zero to no taxes over there. Oh, wow. So... Yeah, because so fishing boat it is then. Yeah, fishing boat it is. Actually, we had people in the camp that <laughs> they were looking at houses to buy and land. And oh, stuff, everyone so, yeah. that goes there has the same idea. Yeah. It's just like very few people have the the courage. But uh, I think it's the kind of life that uh, people aspire to 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 live one day when they retire. You ever hear the story of the the, the fisherman, the businessman? I just love the story. Oh no. So it goes like this: So, guys fishing, you know, at you know on the water. It's like say Costa Rica. Businessman walks up and so you know how many how many hours you fish a day? He goes like ah two to three hours. Oh how many fish do you catch? Like ah maybe one or two, just enough for me and my family. Okay, and he goes well why don't you fish for eight hours a day? And he goes why would I do that? Well if you fish longer you catch more fish, and then you could you know just have more fish. And well, what am I going to do with that? Well if you had more fish you could sell it in the market and make some money. Why would I do that? And he goes oh if you got more money you can buy more rods. And then you can fish more fish. I was like, well, why would I do that? And he goes, well, if you had more fish, you could sell more fish in the market, make more money, and then buy a boat. And why would I do that? So we can go on, out and sea, catch even more fish. Well, why would I do that? And he goes, well, if you had a lot of fish, you accumulate, you know, sold a lot of fish, you make a lot of money, and then you'd be able to sit around the beach and fish all day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, it, it makes you question all these things. And we're on it. I call it the treadmill. You're sprinting to stay in the same place. You sprint, 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 because you got to be, got to make more and more. You're making a hundred grand a year. It's not enough. I got to make double that much. And you just need more and more money. And then it gets to the point where like, is there a moment where you're going to slow down and actually just enjoy life a little bit? You know, it's, it makes you question a lot of things. It's a very slow pace. But I feel it's natural. I feel like we, the environment we live in today is not a natural environment. We are way overworked. We're stressed out. We, I think that we've never been so stressed out in, in the history of human civilization. I think this is probably the most stressed out people have ever been. We've never worked so much. We've never been so ambitious, right? And like just living like that. It's not who I am, you know. Like I'm, I know you're a, you're a very you're a grinder too. I know it's not in our natures to sit back like that, but it feels natural. Like that's kind of way the way things should be. Like it doesn't, like not being stressed is natural. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's interesting because this, this also ties in kind of the competition. I feel, but your level of ambition will essentially keep pushing you to go for more. Yeah, and there's a lot of like, competitors, particularly, have this fallacy that I'm gonna get this gold medal, I'm gonna win this championship, yeah. and then that's gonna satisfy me. Yeah, and it really doesn't. Like, oh no, there's always another milestone. It's like, okay, I want it. Now I have to defend it or yeah. I have to unify this title or I have to grab something else. So like if yeah. your ambition is limitless, which a lot of high achievers yeah. are, yeah. they're going to keep being hungry. And then yeah. you get guys like BJ Penn, for example, who's been fighting for 20 like, what, years, like 20 years yeah. now. And he still wants to fight, but there's really nothing left for him to prove. Yeah. Like, at least you can't go. Of, where do you go from there? Yeah. yeah. From the eyes of a true fan, not like these 
tough movies, yeah. right? They're jumping they're in. Not the trolls, yeah. Yeah, that don't know anything about fighting. Like, he's already done it all. You know, he was yeah. the first American, I think, to win the Mundials. Yes. Right? He won the UFC title. You know, he's fought all over the place. The guy's a legend. But yeah. He didn't it's his quite nature. Set. Yeah. Uh, and some people think he's yeah. lost his money or not. I, I, from my understanding, he comes from a wealthy family. He's it's, well to do. He, yeah. he, he just can't stop. Like it's, it's hits the treadmill. Yeah. Like you're on literally, it's like you're on a treadmill. You have to run, run, run. And it's just, you're not really, because where do you go from there? Like once you achieve what BJ Penn has achieved, like where do you go from there? And uh, I think that guys still get a kick out of just being in the cage and just, you know, it's, you've been doing it for so long. And I know so many of my friends, they can't retire for the same reason. Yeah. You know, like their heart is not even, they barely train, but they still enjoy, you know, doing, I just being on the spotlight and just stepping in the cage and fighting and. Plus, it's good money. Even when a guy, a guy with his name, like win or lose, he's making good money. So. Yeah. So, and I think there's something to be said about learning how to change your your ambition and adapt. Because yeah. if, as a fighter, you really have like maybe 15, 20 years, depending on when you start. Yeah. Before you, you're going to the point where you're going to start hurting yourself and overspending yourself, you know. And uh, I think that's a lot of, also of, like we see a lot of people doing uh, performance enhancing drugs and all that because that's going to extend the shelf life beyond yeah. natural limits. Yeah. You know what I mean? But they have to be able to direct that energy and move it into something else. Like a lot of people obviously go to the coaching angle or open up a school, yeah. you know, they're doing martial arts and, and drive their ambition into something else because otherwise you're just going to run yourself into the ground, you know, doing this and fall apart. And it's it's a tough spot. Like I know we we've had this discussion in private before, and like I've retired about two three years ago, and it's exactly how I feel like you have to reinvent yourself. Like you have to do like what am I going to do now? I'm just going to be a coach, and I love coaching. I love teaching. I love teaching seminars. Um, I love the art, you know, of jujitsu. I love teaching MMA. It's not the same thing as when it's about you. I mean, it's a different kind of satisfaction. Like I get a satisfaction out of what, watching my my students win, but it, it's not the same thing. It's a different kind of feel. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not an easy transition for a lot of people to make. I know I struggle with it. And, uh, but like, you're right. Like there's a, I, I actually believe there's a limit, you know, to how many squats you can do in a lifetime, how many double legs, how many triangles, how for many sure. full locks. Like yeah. there's like a life, like X, you know, 10,000 double legs later or whatever the case is, you know, and we vary genetically. Like some of us take better care of our, our bodies. Like we're healthier, we do better, you know, like we just, we, we have a, a, a better shelf life than, than other people. But think of it as like a vehicle. Like no matter how well you take care of your vehicle, there's only so many miles it can drive. Yeah. It's just going to be a minute there. That car is going to be like, okay, it's time. This is, this is junk now. You can't do anything with this. Exactly. And, it, and it, the same thing happens to the body. Like it's sure. say We have this idealistic approach to nature. I feel that some people believe that, oh, if only I eat healthy and take really good care of myself, I'm going to be super healthy when I'm 80. I'm like... If you're 80 and you're able to be super healthy in all these activities, I guarantee you are not a professional athlete when you were 20, 30. And that's amazing that people that age can still work out and do stuff. And I think that's incredible. But I can almost guarantee you those people are not professional athletes. Because when you train like a professional athlete for 20 years of your life, what you're doing is you're, you're aging so much faster internally, right? Like your joints are aging, your lower back, your neck is aging so much faster than it would than if you just had like a normal life, right? It's not normal to train twice a day six days a week that's not natural for 20 years straight at high intensity too not just oh i'm going for a swim little yoga fun here like no we're talking like i'm trying to beat you into the ground every day of my life it's, just it's like not a car metaphor you know yeah, I mean? you're, putting, you're putting a lot more mileage and even if you're doing all your oil changes and tire rotations it's like you're driving your car to california at 150 miles an hour for 20 years straight like i don't have care how good your yeah. vehicle is it's going to break down eventually so um there is a life to it so like i advise athletes to be intelligent about how they train and Take recovery seriously, even if you don't feel that you need to recover and stretch and do all this stuff, do it because it will extend that, that shelf life, right? Yeah, I'm in that process <laughs> right now. You're smarter than I am. Like we talk about this, like, you actually do more, like, you know, you take better care of yourself than, than well, I, I do. I, I've I, been better about stretching. I've, I've been doing that much at least. I, I just actually pulled my bicep the other day, just over, over training a bit. I just finished doing a back and biceps. Yeah. And then I'm like, let me get some heavy bag work. Yeah. Started hitting the bag. I yeah. threw an open left hook and just boom, my arm popped right in the middle. Yeah, because your, your yeah. muscles aren't prepared for it anymore. Yeah, you're not used to it. It's probably been like, what, a long time since you threw a left hook, right? Well, no, I've been doing it every day in the bag, but it's just, okay. 
I had them burn out, so everything to failure. So oh, the bicep okay, curls. So the arm was already tight. You know what I mean? But I went a little bit too far. So now I've been sitting out for like four or five days. It is like, what it is, man. Yeah. It's so you know what? Like deep down, you always knew that though. Like you always knew that that. Pro- I, I no regrets, man. Like I, I would never recommend someone. Oh, don't train. I'm like, you know, it's fine. Like I'm, when people walk through the door at my gym, I tell them jujitsu isn't healthy. Everyone's like, oh, jujitsu is healthy. Like, it, it's not healthy. <laughs> It's mentally healthy. Like, it's not yes. physically healthy. Stop lying. It's not true. It's going to destroy your joints. Yeah, if you go really, really easy, you know, twice a week, it's not. But, like, are you really getting a lot out of it if you're only training twice a week at a low intensity? If you want to get good at it, you're going to have to train at a high intensity, and that's going to cause a cost. But I tell it to people it's mentally healthy, which is the kind of health I really, I really care about. For sure. Like, I've, I've lived my life. I mean, I've lived a very happy life primarily because I've been so engaged. I'm sure you can relate to yeah. what I'm doing. I'm so involved. I'm so immersed in the moment. And it's given me so much meaning. It's like everything that would normally throw people off track psychologically didn't bother me. Like the stuff that would bother most people. Like, like I, didn't, I didn't know what anxiety was until like I retired. I'm like, what was this? Like people keep talking about it. I had no idea what, I had no idea what people were talking about. And after I retired, I was like, oh, oh, that's what people were talking about. Like I started dealing with issues that people deal with their whole lives. But it's because like jujitsu keeps you so mentally healthy. You know, it's such a beautiful place to be. But well, it's kind of like that meme they have uh, where it shows a guy coming from work and he has all the little thought bubbles about stress yeah. about work. Yeah. And then when he gets into training, he's like, oh, the only thing he's thinking about is watch out for the armbar. Yeah. The and then yeah. when he finishes training, he's just clear minded. You know, yeah. and it, I, I feel like kind of the same way as you is like stress wise, when you train for combat and you're doing MMA and ground and pound and all that. You realize like what people normally stress about, like, oh, this girl doesn't like me. Oh, I'm going to get bad grades. That means nothing compared to survival. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. But see, these are like first world problems. Yeah. You know, like these are the kind of social problems that we've created, which are harder to get away from in modern life. Right. That's yeah. why I feel like when you said like we're much more stressed than we are now, yeah. because we have a lot more games and a lot more rules. Yeah. Because of the abundance that we have. Yeah. Where we don't really worry about survival anymore. Like, no, exactly. Survival has yeah. become so easy. It's that, like anybody can survive. Yeah. And you don't even have to do the effort yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you got welfare. No, you're, 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 so people support you. So, like, survival is very low end in America, at least. You know what I mean? Like, in a first world country like we are, survival is not really a, a threat. Life has gotten so easy. I feel that it's, we, we have so much free time on our hands. There are people who are literally making fortunes talking about being successful versus actually. You know, people don't have to develop any skills anymore. It's like, Talking about skills has become a skill. It's a weird thing when you think about it. Like, yeah. like I, you, you know me. Like, I hate these motivational speakers. I think they're a bunch of crooks. You know, they got nothing to say in reality. But, like, they're talking about success. They're talking about doing it. Like, you get Tony Robbins. He talks about business, business, business. Like, he's never run a business. But he's telling people how to run a business, even though he's never done it. Like, his business is talking about business. Which is a strange thing when you think about it. Because normally, it's like, you have a skill. I'm a plumber. I'm a... I'm a carpenter, or I, or I teach jujitsu, or I, I, you know, like there's a skill that, that serves a, a practical purpose in society, right? Jujitsu probably doesn't really fit in that category. That's we tough. could probably go without jujitsu for the most part, but like there's certain things, like you can't imagine a world without a plumber. That would suck, right? Not having a plumbing system, yeah. that would be horrible. I can easily imagine a world without motivational speakers. I don't feel like they bring, like that there's certain professions that are absolutely necessary, but like life has become so abundant that you know, it's created these categories that aren't really practical. Like there are all these people that are making money and being successful at things that don't really bring anything to the table. Right. So it's more ideas that they're trading in yeah, it's, rather it's, than like yeah. uh, services or actual It's emotional, products. I think, to some extent. Like it's, like it's an emotional fulfilling. Like people like hearing what they want to hear and they, they feel good about themselves after a talk like that. Like now I'm motivated to do something with my life. I don't know. Um, but like, it, you're right. It's, it's, I think it's a reflex of the abundance we live in. Like when life has never been so easy, I'm convinced. Like, yeah. I think we live better. A poor person in, in the United States lives better than Kings did 500 years ago. Like oh, that's me. That's for a, sure. that's as far a, as access to services. Oh, and absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I think that essentially created, because we always need to have problems. Yeah. You know, we're conflict resolution machines. Yeah. If there's zero conflict. There's pretty much no reason to live. Yeah. Right? There's always a problem. Oh, life is horrible without problems. Yeah. A life devoid of problems is absolutely, there's nothing and, worse than not having problems. you create interesting problems when you have no problems. Like if you look yeah. at every celebrity that <laughs> has a drug crisis exactly right, or something yeah. like that, like 
you yeah. need a challenge somewhere. Yeah. You know, you need to be challenged. And I think yeah. that's, Joe Rogan's a big proponent of challenging yourself physically. Right? Absolutely. To try to take away from all the mental stress that people have. Just go yeah. in the gym and kill yourself. You know, get something in there so you can feel a struggle. Yeah. You know, because the emotional struggles are very tricky to play with and yeah. we're very well we're very under equipped on dealing with them as well yeah. you know like most people don't know how to em handle emotional problems at the level that a, a physical one because physical ones are easier to see they're right in front of you you know a lot of people like psychologically don't know how to deal with problems they put them in the back of the head and they manifest into and, and but that's another that. like sign of the age i feel like people see problems as something that oh it's bad and like okay I, I understand sometimes we have like there's, there's a lot going on. Everyone gets stressed out. But, like, for the most part, you're right. Like, we are problem-solving machines. We enjoy that. I think that's one thing that we all have to better ourselves at. Like, I, I, I try with this a lot is trying to improve on myself in the sense where I, 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 I embrace those problems as challenges. It's like jujitsu. That's how I look at life, right? You get caught in a triangle. You know, you have to figure out how to get out of that triangle. It's a problem. Yep. You got to solve it. Um, with that being said, like, Sometimes we create problems and we stress ourselves out over things that aren't really that important. And I think that's the real key is like focus on the stuff that matters. Yeah. Like sure. I know I spend a lot of time like focused on things that don't really matter. They're not really important in the grand scheme of things. Um, but they stress you out at any rate. They yeah. do. I try to think of everything in those survival problems. Yeah. If this is not going to affect me from living, it's not a serious problem. Yeah. Right? This is essentially I created a problem in my head. Which is fine if I wanted to, but it shouldn't stress me out to the point where I lose sleep or I'm getting into fights with, you know, my friends and family over it. It shouldn't be to that level, you know. And 99% of people don't really have those survival problems. Yeah. At least. But that's that's a, but that's a rational approach. Stressing out over meaningless things is an emotional thing. Yeah. It's very difficult because you can tell yourself all day that it is irrational to stress over something that doesn't really affect your life, like you're saying. But it's something completely different to apply that into your life. It's a very different things. Uh, it's a hard thing to do. But you're right. Like, I, I tell myself that, too. I go, like, yeah, it shouldn't matter. But it still bugs you. <laughs> you know, like, it's still, like, it still bothers you, you know, even though it shouldn't. Yeah. yeah. I'm an engineer, so logic and rationality come naturally to me. That's good, man. Yeah, like, but... that's a, I, I, it's, it's a gift. But I think, I, I mean, I would like to say that I'm not an emotional, or, but, like, I am. Like, I am an emotional person just in my own way. Uh, yeah, and I think that, yeah, you got to balance these things out, you know, and I think jujitsu teaches that, man. Like, I, I feel that like jujitsu really balances people out. One example, like a little switching gears there a little bit, one thing that I, I get a lot when parents walk through the door is they're worried that their child is, like, either too aggressive or underconfident, and I always tell them this, and I feel very confident about this, that it's, it's true, is that jujitsu levels you out. It brings you to where you're supposed to be. It's a very mild in the middle individual. So if you're overconfident, you're going to get beat up by someone half your size. Sure. Kind of puts you back in your place. So the bully gets in the gym and goes, oh, I'm not as awesome as I thought I was. I just get, got my butt kicked by the 13-year-old green belt, you know. And then you get the kid who can't even make eye contact. He's very shy, very awkward. And he walks into the gym and he just starts winning all of a sudden. It's like it just boosts his confidence, you know. Like you see his posture changes. You can see even the way they walk and the way they talk to you changes over time. So it's, I think it's like a, an added benefit of martial arts um, that people overlook. I think people focus a lot on the self-defense and the physical aspect. But as far as the, the confidence and the, 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 how much it improves on your character, I think that's probably the biggest, the best benefit of what this, the, this art has to offer. And it's overlooked. People don't pay a lot of attention to it. For sure. And I was going to bring that up when you were talking about motivational speakers. Or whatever, yeah. Because they, I think they, there's a place for it. And yeah. they're trying to instill these virtues, but like in a laboratory environment, just yeah. kind of injecting them into you. Yeah. Whereas when you're doing the martial arts, you're gaining them through experience, through actual... It's inside out. It's real. Yeah. It's something that starts... I, I, that I 100% agree with. Right. So that's yeah. what I love about... And for me, the, like... We said this before, I'll say it again though. Like, if you were to offer me all the fortunes and magical powers of the world, but you have to strip my martial arts experience, I wouldn't take it. 100%. Because no. you would kill me then. Yeah. I'm no longer me anymore. Yeah. Right? That'd be, that'd be the, that is your biggest stretch. You take it for granted though. Yeah. You take it for granted when you think about it. Like, I know I do. Like, I'll be, it's the greatest treasure you have. It's yeah. becoming who you are 
and the experience you gain over time and how this, these experiences shape you into who you, and then, and, 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 and you know, as long as you love yourself, of course, you're completely happy with who you are. Yeah, it's the best, the biggest treasure you have is your experience. Like I would not, I would not trade trade it for all the money. Like, if you like take my jujitsu experience for all the money in the world, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. Like I can't. I have to reinvent. Okay, I have all this money, but the, who am I now? Yeah, exactly. I've yeah. lost my identity entirely. Like this sucks. Yeah. So like to me, that's the value of it, and it instills all these virtues, but like yeah. kind of like silently. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm not saying, oh, I'm going to teach you confidence because you're going to do this. No, like you're going to gain the confidence as you get better and you improve. So I think it's a better instru- it's a better vehicle for well, learning they, these values versus me telling you this is what confidence is and this yeah. is how someone displays confidence and yeah. this is what I mean like it's artificial it's artificial it's yeah. really I mean some people can pick it up like that you know what I mean God bless them but most people have a hard God, time I, yeah. Amen God bless them like I don't know how that works like I can't imagine like, I because I learn from experience like yeah. you can tell me not to stick my arm in there and to get triangle a million times like I have to get triangle three or four times for me to learn the lesson. And my experience as a coach is exactly that. You tell people, yeah, yeah, you shouldn't like stick your arm out there. They're going to do it. They're going to do it three, four times. And then from that experience, it's like they're learning in, they're absorbing information in a more natural and efficient way. Like the artificial injection, just listening to people talk about improving on yourself. I personally don't think it's very effective. But like, you know, some people are different. Everyone's different. I'm just speaking for myself. No, I mean, I think that's, True for everybody. I think that's why most people love doing this sport, as you said, because it's not the healthiest thing in the world, even though that's not a good thing to say since we're in the business. I I, I mean, I should be the last. My my livelihood depends on this. But I I like to tell people the truth uh, and like so they don't create expectations. And I'm like, I think it doesn't stop you from training, though. Like I tell them that. Like it does. I don't think anyone's like turned around like oh, I'm not going to train that because it's going to hurt. I'm like it's going to hurt, but you get over it, man. Like you know, yeah, it's not. It's, it's not. Life, you know what it's, I mean? Hey, there are sports yeah. that are way worse. I think football is worse. I think. Oh, for sure. I mean, definitely boxing and MMA. I think uh, like dirt bikes. Like man, that's like dangerous sport, right? To physically talking about health. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of unhealthy stuff up there, but yeah, jujitsu is. You know, it's probably it's not the worst. It's just not. It's I wouldn't call it. I think probably swimming is like. Yeah, physically healthy, you know, like like maybe like a light little jog, like you can call yeah, those physically I think it's, healthy. It's, it's gotta be really hard to injure yourself swimming. I think repetition, you can like mess yeah, up your shoulders yeah. over time, but or drowning, or <laughs> <laughs> not a very good. <laughs> I, I, I suppose it could happen, uh, but yeah, man, like yeah, you had, there's no impact. Like it's probably the, the healthiest sport out there. I would think so. Man. Boring though. Of Boring. Oh, my, my mother was like Olympic caliber swimmer. She's a very accomplished swimmer. Um, she tried to get me into swimming when I was a kid, and I just, I just hated it, man. It's so boring. Like nothing. I like jogging. I hate jogging. I'll do it, but like I don't like it. Like it's at least with so jogging, slow. though, like if you're doing it outdoor, you're, you're seeing a lot of. If yeah. you do like a good hike or something, it's kind of cool. It's yeah, the but, visuals. But in the pool, no. you're just like it's the same stuff. It's just it is hard. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. demanding, and you don't get anything out of it, man. Like there's no. I don't my know. girlfriend loves to swim. She's a really. Good I know swimmer. some people and love we'll it. Go, like, it was not too long ago. We went to Barbados. I should go on the beach. Yeah. And just just swim out, way out. And I'm like the parent. I'm like. <laughs> Yo, don't go that far back because there's waves and yeah, if, I, yeah. if I can't reach you, I can't save you, you know, yeah, yeah. like if I could, you know. I remember at one point she kept going and I chased her and then there was a riptide and it took us a good 10 minutes swimming against it's it. It's rough, man. Come back. Yeah, like, man, it's exhaustion swimming is not... <laughs> no, we were, uh, uh, I was just like, we went like snorkeling in uh, in Costa Rica and like, oh, I'm going to swim to that little beach over there, which seems like super close. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'll be there in five minutes. Like 30 minutes later, I'm like out of breath. Yeah. Like next thing you know, like I'm drinking salt water because like the water is not, that's yeah, not yeah, calm, you know? Yeah. And I was like, oh man, this sucks. I turn around. Like I got close to the beach and I kind of turn around because it's, it's very physically demanding, no doubt. Yeah, because I think weight in itself is, is one way of measuring so, because obviously if someone's heavier, you associate that with they have more muscle mass or, or whatnot, so it's not an equal contest, right? Because the whole idea is supposed to be equality, right? Yeah. Like we make these weight divisions so that you don't have a 140-pound guy fighting a 250-pound yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely. Obviously, we can look at that. like that no, one And it's, it, it is an advantage. Yeah. Weight is a factor, 100%. But when you get like some people who are like 150 and you might have someone else who's 150, even though they're on the same weight, it's still not a fair contest because maybe, like you said, someone has 
His heart is bigger. Yeah, or double tendons and whatnot. He's got a ridiculous grip. But, so like we can't make yeah. it like a... If it was a 100% level playing field physically, yeah. which I guess would be the ideal. Because the whole idea is to measure who's got the better technique yeah. and who's got the better mental faculties, yeah. right? But, but that's in, in itself another thing that might not be equal as well. Yeah. Right? Uh, and and, and, and you, you, said the, 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 you said the key word here is ideal. Yeah. The ideal is, you know, that every, it's a matter of work ethic and everything else is the same. And the truth is sports are not fair. The world is not fair and it starts from the day you were born. Like it's just the reality of things. If you're short, you're never going to play in the NBA. If you're tall, you're never going to be an elite gymnast. For you to be an elite gymnast, you have to be short. Look at elite gymnasts. They're not tall. There's yeah. a reason for that, right? Like so your genetic setting determines you know, what sports you're going to be apt to be good at. And there are exceptions. You can talk about the exceptions, but I don't, the exceptions don't tell the story. Correct. They tell Correct. like a very small piece of the story. You have to look at the average. The average gymnast is short. There's a reason for that, you know. Um, the quality is for jiu-jitsu, I think, you know, for 16th MMA and, 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 and grappling. There, a lot of them are psychological. Yeah. And you can't even begin to measure those. Which but, is what makes it more interesting as a sport, yeah. I feel, is that there is so much variance because there's a lot of skill sets you have to learn mm -hmm. when, you, uh, when you compare the difference between boxing to mma is enormous because you open up first of all rather than having just two weapons we potentially have eight you know yeah. with punches elbows knees kicks and, and then you also have all the grappling and the wrestling and the yeah. jiu-jitsu so it's why i still don't think there's an ideal body type that's been discovered yet yeah Although fighters seem to be getting taller. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember when I was like, like in the 90s, like if you're like 185, 170, you're around 5'10, 5 5'11. 5 that was like a good height. Now it's like 6'2, 6 6'3. 6 oh, no, 155 pounds. Yeah, you know, 100%. because the reach is obviously a big advantage. You, you know, my favorite movies of all time is called Gattaca. Have you ever seen yes, Gattaca? Yes, yes. It's yes. such a great movie. And I think we're really moving in that direction. Yeah. It's just a matter of time before you're, you're, you're buying better jeans for your children. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I think it's a 1999 movie. Yeah, so it's excellent. Not, it's, movie, yeah, yeah, it's such a great movie. But it basically talks about a not too far, not too distant future where you are picking and choosing what kind of genes your children will, will have. And, you know, you, 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 you breed your children to be outstanding anything, like basketball players, piano players, like swimmers. Yeah, the piano players all had six fingers. Yeah, one yeah. had six fingers. <laughs> like, why not seven, you know? Yeah. So the, the crazy thing about genetics is that you know, we don't even fully comprehend the extent to which we may be able to manipulate it in the future. And it's, it's a very, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. It's a very curious one to me too. And I think it's bound to create a lot of discussion and controversy because where are the limits now? Yeah. Like talking about fairness, let's talk about fairness. You're buying your children, you know, an enormous advantage on a give, given sport now. Let's say, let's call it football. You, you know, you breed your child genetically to be like an NFL player. Of course, they're going to do better. Why are yeah. you surprised? You can like you imagine you could tweak like mental traits too that might make you better, more apt for for a sport like football, for example, or MMA for that matter, or anything. Huge advantage. I can imagine if you could do that. Would how would how would you begin to talk about fairness with that sort of uh, a background? You know, and I, I think that the, 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 whatever fairness it, it exists now is going to be out the window once we get there. You know, I think that's what kind of rubs people the wrong way because they want the illusion that it's a level playing field. Yeah. You just have to put in the time yeah. and uh, everybody has the same chance. Yeah, everyone, it's, it's a myth. And it's it, not, it, it, Gattaca is a great example yeah. of that movie because the protagonist of that movie, it's not a spoiler, he yeah. is like the last of an old generation that was born naturally. Natural. They call them, there's a name for it, they call them... Uh, Natural, I think. I think that's the word. They, there's a name for him. Yeah, yeah, so he doesn't have all these genetic gifts that everybody yeah. else has. Or he does, he just, but like, it's, he's a normal person. It's he probably normal. has some gift, but he can't even compare. Yeah. And if he wanted to swim, he wouldn't stand a chance. Exactly. Yeah. And he had to essentially, his whole story was he just used incredible amounts of willpower, you yeah. know, to overcome where he's at. But, you know, there's a certain extent where, and you see, in that movie, it was kind of idealistic in a sense that it was just he all his mental... It willpower was enough to overcome his yeah. physical disadvantages and the whole thing was the people with the physical advantages had essentially a mental disadvantage because yeah. they didn't need to be as they didn't need to work as hard yeah to achieve you know what yeah, he yeah. had to so he, yeah. he had developed a stronger will 
just by virtue of being physically impaired. Yeah, yeah. You know? And and that right there is an interesting discussion because it, it, it brings us to a very controversial discussion in the sciences, which is a matter of the will. To what degree is that a... a is um, there's a deterministic approach and there's a way like, oh no, you're absolutely in charge of your own decisions and will will outdo anything. And even that right there to some extent might be genetically determined. Some people might have more drive than others and that may be genetically determined as well. It's not out in the open. You know, right. well, they, that, I mean, if you breed and, dogs, they, are, they, they, they it, tend to breed traits. And yeah. if exactly, and if the same is true for humans, which yeah. were part of the natural world, just like any other animal, then yes, these traits would be genetically determined. So yes, some people would have a higher degree of will than you know the person next to them. Very interesting discussion. To me, this is fascinating, and it's very controversial. It's something that scientists are very far from understanding, from what I know. Like it's very controversial. They don't agree. Scientists do not agree on this. There's a lot of discussion, and um, I mean, sports is like one arena where this. We'll discussion yes sure. yeah because it's it's not it's it's not the same not everyone even if I, I could think of myself like for example like i've always been very flexible right but i've never been very powerful i've never had a lot i've never been a powerful individual i've never been like you put me sprinting i'm not a good sprinter i never was like i can't you know bench press or squat i never have been that guy but i've always been very flexible and people always ask me they go rob are you are you stretch a lot I'm like, no i don't stretch at all They're like no you got to be stretching a lot because like, like when i was younger could put the leg, my legs behind my head. And, it, yeah. and it, was not, it was not difficult because it was just naturally flexible, right? So I imagine like that goes for everything. There's some things that are, I mean, imagine had I worked my flexibility, it would have been contortionist maybe. Like maybe yeah. I wouldn't be exceptionally flexible, right? But I think there are a lot of things that are, that are traits that we have that, that are just so natural. That, like, like Hafia, Rafael Domingos. Yeah. He could get a job tomorrow with Cirque du Soleil if he wanted without even trying. Like you think he, you'd think that he's in the circus all day. Yeah. You would think that he's a gymnast. He's never done anything. He just does jujitsu and he's just kind of just like, yeah, I do a backflip here. You know, he moves like a ninja. And so it's just his natural gift to move like a cat. You know, and I don't have that. Like I try moving like that. I can't move like that. It's not a matter of will. My body does not move. I might have to sit my weight as well. But yeah, it's just, I think even like, there's so much that, that, is, that is determined by, it's not up to your will, I don't think. Yeah, I, and I think that's something people have to be grown up about and realize that it's not equal. Yeah. There's no level playing field. Yeah. It is what it is, but it, that shouldn't stop you from playing the game. Absolutely not. Right? Like whether if we're in a hill, there might be some people that start here, you might start here, yeah. you know, but you still want to get up that hill. But, but I, I, this reminds me of an argument I make a lot of times when, when I teach seminars, I always open up for Q&A, right? So one of the most common questions I get is um, a lightweight will ask me, Rob, I can get smashed by everyone at the gym, right? And what do I do? And I say, you are privileged. And they look at it like this. You are lucky to get smashed. And you are lucky to be lighter because jiu-jitsu is harder for a heavier weight. I'm like, what do you mean it's harder? You're winning. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly why it's harder. How do you learn when you're always winning? It's mm -hmm. harder to learn when you're winning. It is easier to learn when you're losing. So going back to your hill analogy, let's say I'm here and you're here. For you to be where I'm at, you have to run this much more. You will experience jujitsu to a degree that I didn't have, I don't experience because you're going to have to run so much more than me. So in a way, having a disadvantage should be looked at as a privilege. It's something good. If you have that outlook on life, right? If you just want the reward, I just want the recognition, the medal, the belt, whatever, then yeah, okay, being light and unathletic sucks. Okay. But if you're looking at it from a growth perspective, when you're looking at life or sports for that matter, from a perspective of... Uh, I really want to improve on myself, then being unathletic is an advantage because you're going to get more, more steps out of the journey than someone who is extremely athletic ever will. Even if they become a UFC champion and you don't, it's like you've experienced more because it was so much harder. It's kind of like that Gattaca example again because I, I talked about this in, a, in one of my blogs, but uh, something that as a teacher, what we value more than anything is someone who is consistent and dedicated that comes all the time. And I was talking about uh, who was just a, who won the fight. The kid uh, that really annoys everybody. <laughs> he's going to be fighting with Usman. You know what I'm talking about? Colby something. Colby Covington. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Like I said, he's not exceptional anywhere as far as technically. Yeah. He's not, a, I mean, he's okay boxer. And he's a yeah. good wrestler. He's a yeah. decent grappling. But his exceptionality is his cardio. 
and he's able to consistently apply pressure to the point where people can't keep up with him. Yeah. And now that's his exceptional trait. Yeah. His consistent output, right? And I was saying the same could be true, you know, for anybody. If you consistently show up to training all the time, you'll outdo people who might be technically more uh, uh, better than you or stronger than you just because you're getting more experience and you're going to learn better, right? And what happens is a lot of people who are naturally talented, and you've, I'm, I'm sure you've seen as many as I have, they just wither away because if you have like a normal level of ambition and you're a naturally athletic, you'll achieve success early without putting as much output. And that might be enough for you. It means, it means less. Yeah. And yeah. It, you might be, I'm good with that. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that per se, but yeah. you're not going to achieve as much because you're already satisfied early yeah. versus somebody who's hungry at the bottom and has to work twice as hard to get where you're at. Chances are they are, they're hungry for more too because yeah. like you, your appetite grows as you accomplish more. You're like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. I'm going to try to go for more. It's like people who start climbing mountains. They, they, they climb I, a small mountain. That, they're okay, now I'm going to go K1 and then they're going to go. I 100% you know. agree with and I think that is... It is something that will strengthen your character. Yeah. Like going through that hardship, right, of battling and having to climb higher than the person next to you because you started lower, right? Um, that is, that is, it strengthens your character. Uh, and in some ways, I, I, I feel like I have to be honest because, like, when I was a kid, I was not a good athlete at all. Like, I remember this well when I was, um, when I played soccer, I grew up in Brazil, it was a lot of soccer. Yeah. People would pick teams and always went to really good kids. And there was the mediocre kids, and then me, and then all the fat kids. I was like in between the mediocre kids and the fat kids. Like I was that guy, right? And it's been like that in every sport I've ever practiced. And in jiu-jitsu, I was not talented at all. Like people are like, oh, you're foolish. Like, no, man, I was, trust me, I remember well my first few months. Like I was getting beat by everyone. I remember like my best friend, I introduced him to jiu-jitsu six months into me training jiu-jitsu, right? So after one month of him training, he was tapping me. And I've been training for seven months. And we're the same size. Yeah. That destroyed me mentally. I'm like, how is this possible? It means so much more to me than it means to him. He didn't care. He was just talented. He was just gifted, right? And he's beating me with one, one month in. But in a way, that was single-handedly my best friend because that what it's exactly what you're describing. It told me, like, no, 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 I'm going to figure this out. Like, I don't care. It's hard for me. I don't care if I'm not, if I'm not gifted. Like, this is going to be single-handedly the most important thing in the world to me. And I was always the most competitive guy in the gym. Like that was my strength. It wasn't the fact that I wasn't stronger or faster than anyone or more technical. I was, I've never been the most, tech, most technical guy in the gym. But I've, I've, I always feel like I was the most competitive guy in the gym. Like that was my strength, right? And that came from exactly the fact that it was so hard for me in the beginning when I started. So like I, I relate to that a lot. And I think that in a way, like going back to what I was saying, like being at a disadvantage is an advantage. Yeah. Because it will strengthen you in ways that you know, you may not be, you would, if you are gifted, you know, you would have not been strengthened that way. There's a, my girlfriend had sent me an article, but there's a Japanese art form. I don't remember the, the title of it, but essentially what it says is that when in Japan, when they break a piece of uh, China or whatnot, rather than throw it away, they'll fix it by gluing it together or whatnot. But when they fix it, they'll actually use like, gold or silver to fill in the cracks so it essentially it creates a unique art form yeah now. and this article is essentially saying that's how we have to do with ourselves right like when we have a flaw it's just an opportunity to fill it in with something beautiful yeah right so like and there's lots of stories of people who have you know deficits so to speak or you know disadvantages and they turn that disadvantage into an asset yeah you know and i think it Everybody has flaws yeah. for the most part, right? So we have to find a way of not defining yourself by, oh, this is, I'm broken and this is why. Yeah. Like, no, this might have been an, an issue with me, but I fixed it in such a way where now I'm stronger because of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm more beautiful or whatever the case may be. But there, there are those freak athletes that we had mentioned where, for example, someone like Yo Romero. Yeah. He's probably from outer space. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, like right? Jacare. But, but yeah, like some of these guys are just like, they're crazily you, gift, gifted. Yeah, like John Jones. So yeah. when you have somebody who has high natural abilities and also has a high level of ambition, then you're in problems. That's, that's when you get, like, <laughs> I, I, I call that the Mozart effect. Yeah. Like, why was Mozart incredible? Oh, he was gifted. I'm sure he was gifted. But what else? He was also born in Austria, which was the capital of classical music in the world at the time, right? His father was also a musician. 
you also had the ambition. He had the, he, was, he had a passion for music. You combine that with the talent, and now you get that's how you get a Mozart. Yeah. You know, had Yo Romero. He was born in Cuba. Cuba has a very strong tradition in wrestling. Had he been born in Paraguay, we'd have never heard of him. Yeah. You know, so it, where you are plays a role. Um, I mean, that we having the right coaches, the right track. I think there's a number of factors that there's a lot of moving parts in creating someone like highly successful GSP, for example. It's not just one thing. And I, if I had to rank, and I think you'll probably agree with me, if I had to rank, I think single-handedly the most important thing here is your your, your motivation, your will, sure. your desire. And I, I think even deeper than that, how what does it mean to you, right? Because I think that's the big thing that a lot of competitors get wrong is they're doing it for the wrong reasons. And motivation is something that changes over time. Like I think that, you know, sometimes fighters are – you start because you want to prove yourself to the world and you end your career, you're just doing it for the money to feed your family. The motivation changes yes. along the way. And we see this happen, right? But I think when you're doing it for the right reasons, that's when you skyrocket. And when the right reasons are always internal, at least to me. Like they're not – what I mean by internal is I'm doing it because I love it, because I got to prove it to myself that I can do the very pure reasons. I think when you're doing it for external reasons, I'm doing it for the money, for the popularity, because I want to get a sponsor. I want to get Twitter followers. Like and when you're doing it for those reasons, your motivation is short lived, and it's and it's you. I don't. I can't see you being exceptional with that sort of motivation, because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah. those are very fleeting uh, reasons, right? Like essentially, whether it's like financial or like you said, just like to be famous. And once they're achieved, then it's like, what's the next? Yeah. I mean, some people are obviously very well motivated by money and they can continue to, you know, like you have guys who are billionaires and they keep going for more, you know, but uh, it comes back to the beginning really where you essentially need to find a balance at at some point as far as how much you want to work to get something. Yeah. Right. Because in order to be a high achiever, you're going to always be pushing yourself and you, you can't really relax. Yeah. Right. And I guess you have to ask yourself, like, how important is it to achieve all this versus being able to be at peace with myself? Right? And I, that brings you back to going to Costa Rica and just chilling out. You know, you don't the need, fisherman versus the businessman. Right, yeah. right. And so there's a balance between like how much you really want to go out there and do all these crazy things and be super famous and be super wealthy versus just being happy with yourself. You know, I think most they're, people, they're very different philosophies, though. Right? Oh, they're, yeah. they're completely they're, they're different. They're, they're right? polar opposites, but I, I think, because I, I, I would like to be the guy that's at peace, and you know, but it's not who I am. Not right now. Like right now, I'm out to accomplish and like do things. Like so, that's where my my heart is. But I think that comes a time in every person's life where they're gonna want to like, okay, I've done enough, and relax. And I think there's a time for that. And I think there are phases we go through. But ultimately, as humans, we all strike in a balance. My balance may not be the same as your balance. Mm-hmm. Our balance might be all we're, all, we're not clones. We're all different, man. So your balance may be, I know friends of mine that found that piece early on. And they don't, haven't accomplished like much in life, but they're perfectly happy. I'm like, hey, man, good for you. Like, they find that balance early on in life. Like, for me, that balance is somewhere else. Uh, but, like, I think, that, I think that's how we are, people. Like, we, we can't be, it's like everything you, you, you do, it, there's, there's a balance. You can't be overly ambitious because I think that's an unhealthy lifestyle. And eventually, it, you know, it will, it will corrode you if it doesn't, if you don't balance that out with something else. And I don't want to be a bum either. Yeah. You know, I don't want to be the guy who just, like, sits by the beach all day doing absolutely nothing. Like, I like to do that once a week, <laughs> maybe twice a week one day. But, uh, yeah, like, it's, it, it's. It's interesting because I the jujitsu does expose you to this conundrum, and I think it's one of the most interesting topics regarding the human condition is this discussion about you know ambition versus you know relaxing. One of my favorite philosophers is is, is Schopenhauer, you know, Arthur Schopenhauer, and he, he he's he's on the other end of the spectrum. He goes like you know life is painful, right? And it's because you have ambition. Ambition brings pain. So he compares life to a pendulum between um, boredom and accomplishment. So you, you you accomplished, you know, you get bored because you accomplished, and then you got to accomplish something else, and then you get bored, and there's no end to that. You're you're trapped in this eternal cycle of, of of misery because no matter what car you buy next week, you want a better car. No matter how nice your car is, you know, you got a better car, you know, by next year and whatever. And to him, like the way out of that, this is a trap. You believe that that was a trap. There's no escaping this. 
the, tra the way out of this was through arts, the admiration and the appreciation of arts, because art to him was an end in itself. When you listen to music and you appreciate music for what it is, you're not aspiring for anything. Like that is, music is an end in itself. And that's kind of how I look at jiu-jitsu these days, really in the most genuine art form that I, 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 I love jiu-jitsu for what it is. I don't have to get anything. Before I had to get something out of jiu-jitsu. It was a means to an end. My ambition, I had to prove it to myself or whatever, right? I like medals. I, I have an ego. I want to be seen and recognized or whatever. But I, I look at jiu-jitsu very differently now and I feel like an art form in the sense where I can go and can go to the gym and I can roll with you and have a good time and I don't have to win. You see what I'm saying? Right. Whereas 10 years ago, if I didn't win, I'd be, I'd be, I, it would upset me, you know, because I was trying to prove something. It's different. Uh, and I think when you look at jiu-jitsu like that as a form of art that brings you peace, then that's when jiu-jitsu is at its best. Well, it's similar to what I would tell my fighters or any competitor, really. The goal of competition is not to win. Yeah. The, at least for me. The goal of competition was always to do your best. Because winning is not something that a fighter determines. That's what the judges or the referee is going to decide. Yeah. And we've seen people get robbed from all sorts of bad decisions. And there's things that happen that are out of your control. You know? And most of us, when you're competing, the stress is about winning. I don't want to lose in front of, the, uh, in front of my girlfriend. Or I don't want to lose and disappoint my coach. I mean, how many times do you have a competitor go, oh, sorry, and they lose? It's like, don't be sorry to me. I'm not the one <laughs> you let down. You yeah, know what they, they feel you're disappointed. Right? Yeah. Because they have this thing, right? So to me, the whole goal is just to do your best. If you did your best, that's all as a coach I could ask yeah. out of a competitor. But doing your best is not easy either. That means you, you came in prepared, you went to training every day, you dieted right, and you came in. So it's a very ambitious goal to do your best. But if I see a fighter does their best or they're close to it, I'm happy with it, right? And as a competitor, I would feel happy with that as well. Because now, like you said, in the art form, I'm part of a, a composition, you know? And the match hopefully was a beautiful match for people yeah. to watch, right? And I was a part of that. I've had battles where I lost, like, when I lost to you, I had no shame about it. I yeah. didn't feel bad about it. I put out everything I had. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah. I lost, but I thought it was a good match. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, I, I fought other people that I've lost to. But did to. you always, do you, do you, do you, does that change over time? Because I remember losing back in the day and it destroyed me. It sent me into the closest thing I've ever been to a depression. Like, I would just, I couldn't sleep at night. Like, I'd be, like, it sometimes even cry. Like, I just, I could not stand losing. I just hated every ounce of it. Whereas now, I'm like, I am happy and glad that I lost two final of the world championships at Roger Grace because they taught me so much. I can look at losing now and go, I'm glad it happened, but not at the time. Does that make sense? No. So That's what I'm asking you. Like, I, I'm asking, like, I, how I do you feel about that, it? I felt at the moment there. So, like, I've adopted this. When I was started competing in wrestling, I didn't have it at all. I would, I would lose and I would ball, cry. Like, high school wrestlers are... Very under-equipped and handling process. <laughs> <laughs> you see, and you, and you go to like a, a regional it's, it's tournament. It's a big cry baby. It's big cry baby. It's big cry baby. Like you go to a regional tournament. It's like the one before states, which yeah. is like you have, to be, you have to be the top four. <laughs> and I remember I was with my brother. It's yeah. my senior year, and I was going into the, uh, I guess, the quarterfinals match to determine the yeah. top four. And I was warming up with my brother, and then I saw one of my uh, colleague come out. He's like, ah! And he starts sliding things, and me and my brother look at each other. I guess he lost, <laughs> and we laugh. But then, like thirty minutes later, I ended up losing the quarterfinals yeah. uh, to like a rival, yeah. and then I'm in the back room smashing the lockers with yeah. my hand. Like, yeah. you know, I remember it was a. That's funny. It was one of the few times I saw my father cry because like he's stoic, you know. But yeah. like, he saw me so emotional. He hugged me I'm like. Oh man, this is like a yeah. real thing, but it was meaningless. It's a freaking regional you know, tournament. You know? I, I know, so like, it's it's crazy how yeah. much this affects you. Like I now I look back and I go like that was pathetic, Robert. What were you thinking? Yeah. Why were you crying? You know, but at the time it was just like my world was collapsing. Like it was nothing more important to me. It's it was painful. <laughs> I got to remember the feeling. It, yeah. it hurt. No, it was, but you yeah. know, shouldn't matter. Yeah, it, like so, like now, like afterwards, once I started competing and. In MMA and HB and doing jujitsu and stuff, it didn't really bother me as much because I, I felt like it's just about putting my best effort yeah. out, you know. And I've I've lost some matches where I was really disappointed in myself, and it's because I made either giant errors in the match. So I'm like, I'm better than that. You know what I mean, 
or under bad preparation for that match. So I went in yeah. knowing like I didn't do my best going in. So there were sometimes I won matches, but they were sloppy. Yeah, I wasn't happy. With them. Yeah. See that that's that's happened to me too. Like yeah. I'm more proud of some of my losses than some of my wins because yeah, they're exactly. such sloppy wins. Yeah. Yeah, because I've had some fights that I lost that I battled through. Like I lost, but I mean I fought to the best of my ability. He was just better that day. You know, like. Yeah. I, I didn't play it tactically right or, or whatever the case is. But yeah, like losing has an effect on me like that in a, in a long time now. Well, I haven't been competing in a while. Yeah, like even, even in training though, like I don't, it doesn't bother me as much or as it used to really bother me. Like I, I you, you kind of have to accept it too. You start like, oh, yeah. you know, like I, I, I know I, I don't, I sound like a lot older than I actually am, but my body's like hurts. Like I, I'm not, my body can't take the same amount of training that it used to. For sure. So you have to accept it. There's no, there's no way out of it. And I was training like Vitor the other day and he's like, man, he's putting them like, fuck, I got to run with him, man. Yeah, like yeah, you yeah, can't yeah. like, like, like a year ago, like, okay, you know, now it's like, man, like, because like they're doing this and you're doing that. And it's, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly if we're here or here. I'm not sure yet. Like that's, I'm still like. Am I still no? Maybe I'm, I, I don't know. You don't know exactly where you're, you're situated in the grand scheme of things. But I, I think the more, yeah. especially in the yeah. gym like yours, where you have so many excellent uh, yeah. students and competitors, you have to <laughs> be a lot more humble early or later yeah. because, like, man, like it's hard to stay on top of that hill. You know what I mean? That's a that's a tough. I will to say this. Like when I was training in, like, for example, like in my gym in Miami for a while, it was just me and my brother. Yeah. So me and my brother had these fierce battles but there wasn't really anybody else to challenge us yeah. because we were building up our students yeah. you know but like then at a certain point now we had a lot of top dogs it became harder but towards the end it was now like i was i think in my gym in miami we have a lot of smaller guys a lot of 140s a lot of 150s phenomenal but they're all lighter so like when i was towards the end of my, miami i was like 190 200 it was hard for people to get me but i had such a size advantage and also yeah. a technical advantage and then when i started coming over here now I got guys my size, higher skill level, or bigger than me. I'm like, okay, now I got to put my humble hat on. Because <laughs> like, and and but I will say this though, like, it's exhausting to try to be that dominant guy in the gym all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, because I in my head, I, it's, it's very primal and it's very irrational, and I'm I'm not proud of it, but I'm just being honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was younger, I had to be the best guy in the gym. Like, I just had to be. Like, it bothered me if someone was better than me in the gym. Like whoever that was, even if I was a blue belt, like whoever that was, I'm like that's the guy. I, that's the guy I got to beat. Like that was my target. Like I had to beat him. So he'd be tapping me, but the next time he trained, he tapped me only twice instead of three times. Yeah. And the next time once, and I'm like, okay, we're making progress. Next time I got to catch him, right? But it it gets to the point where like I kind of don't want to be that guy to be honest anymore, man. Like it's exhausting because it's a huge responsibility, man. Because it's a race. Yeah. And I it was like, man, I've been sprinting for a long time, man. Like it's kind of the point, where, like. Okay, I can I'm gonna jog a little bit, and then I'll sprint a little bit, and then I'll jog. It was like verse before, it was just like I had to be that best guy. It is an exhausting place to be, and um, yeah, I think it's natural. It's a natural progression of things. You know, you just gotta. I think it. it's just like if you're a competitor, you're always in that race. Yeah. Right, but if you're not competing full time, professional, like you said, it's gonna be exhausting, and also you're probably putting yourself in harm's way. More often than not, if yeah. you're letting your ego like think, oh, I can't lose to this guy because I have this preconceived notion that I'm better than him or whatnot, and that's what gets you. It hurt. holds you. It holds you yeah. back. Like I, I think that my fear of losing held me back a lot throughout my career. I was so terrified of losing yeah. that I didn't perform as well and as much as I could have had I not been so freaked out about it. Because you, you're and you're right. It also limits you from playing around because right. like. You're only going to play your A game if yeah. you're worried about winning, yeah. you know. And if you're worried about winning, then you're only playing that one game, and you're not expanding the rest of it. Yeah. But always to be on your training. Don't worry about losing. Just play hard, but play everything. Don't just play your strengths because you already know you're strong there, and there's like diminishing gains on that same path. Yeah. Whereas you might have giant holes in your game here that you can make a lot of headway yeah. fast. You know. But if you're always worried about winning, you're never you're not going to take that risk because when you play that new game, you're going to get crushed. Here's the way a sports psychologist told put it this way to me, and it made a lot. It doesn't make sense, but it does make a lot of sense at the same time. It goes like this: you have to want to win a lot more than you are worried about losing. You have to want to win, not not want to lose. Right. So you can't tell yourself I can't lose. That's not how you think. You have to think I want to win. Yes, sir. And it's like, oh, isn't it the same thing? It was like, not no, really. No, it it, it, in theory, yeah. You look at it, it's like, yeah, like you want you want to win and not lose. Yeah, of course. But 
it, it means that it's, it's your mindset, it's your approach because negativity affects you. Oh, yeah. And it's not because the universe is conspiring in your favor. It's because your mind understands what you, you uh, visualize. Yes. If you visualize loss, you're programming your mind not to, to accept that. Or like, oh, someone's taking me down. You accept the takedown when it happens because you've seen yourself getting taken down so many times. When the split second decision comes, you do the wrong thing. Whereas if you have that positive outcome, you know, you program your mind, think of it as a computer, you program it for victory and success, your mind will do the right thing at the right time. Yeah, and, and your, your mind doesn't also handle negative statements well. Yeah. For example, if I tell you guys, and look in the camera, don't think of pink elephant yeah. testicles. You just thought of them, right? Yeah, and then, horrible. And then Why you, would you say <laughs> testicle? I just it's like the pink elephant, man. I just picture the pink testicles. Yeah, it's horrible. Then, when you say you think, Never get you're that. thinking that, and then the, the little like no yeah. smoking sign, the little cross up, like, like no, don't think of that. No. Two girls, one cup thing. You can never get that image out of your head. Like, why did I watch this video? That was horrible. But yeah. a lot of it, you say that's the problem when you say don't lose. Yeah. Because you're, you're seeing lose. I'm like, not that. Yeah. Lose, yeah. not that. You can't do it. It doesn't work that way. You're right. Right. So like when I hear coaches sometimes. Like, to me, it's an amateur level mistake of a coach when they go, you're not tired. Because you just told your athlete, you're tired, not. Right? And that's how the mind processes that statement. Yeah, you, know? you, so you, gotta you say, see the tired. Yeah. yeah. So you got to say you're full of energy or, you know, you got to use the, the positive version of the statement. And yeah. in all forms of coaching and, and self-talk as well, you have to avoid using negative statements because they, they don't people, people, right. You're right. People don't react well to negativity. That, that's, you're, you're right about that. Like that, that, that. But here's the thing, too. Like... I feel like sometimes, like as a coach, I call it a sandwich. That's and that's the method I use. Like I'll give you a compliment. Hey, good job, Dave. Yeah, that was really good, man. By the way, you're doing this, this, and this wrong. But man, that's much better than last time. And keep it up, buddy. Right? Because I feel like some coaches are so worried about their, especially in MMA. You see a lot of this because it's a very different dynamic. And I want to, a different podcast. I want to talk about this dynamic at length because it's a fascinating dynamic where the fight a fighter is actually ahead of the camp. It's not like if you're, in, if you're a wrestler in college, the coach tells you what time to go and what time to stop. Yes, sir. If you're an MMA fighter, you tell the coaches what's going on because you pay them and they're terrified of losing their jobs. So there's a lot of that going on. And uh, like I, I'm the kind of coach where I tell my fighters, I like to tell my fighters what they need to hear. I'll, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you a compliment too, but Amy, if you're doing something wrong, it's my job to correct you. For sure. But a lot of fighters are so scared of, a lot of coaches are so scared of correcting their fighters because they don't want to hurt their feelings. They don't want to upset them. They want to lose their job. Same thing goes for a jiu-jitsu coach in a gym. If I tear my students apart by telling them the truth all the time, I might lose a few students yeah. because they want to be around people who give them the positive message. But the problem with the positive message all the time, that doesn't improve on you because it's too much in your comfort zone. So I think my solution to this, and this is like a podcast in itself. We can do this some other time, Dave. It's it's the sandwich. I'm a big fan of the sandwich. Yeah. Like you give them that, like the, the, the turd sandwich, you know, and... You you you, you, we, got, you got to feed them like, hey, man, this is where you're messing up. Otherwise, you can't, you're not really helping them. Yeah, right? we, we call that uh, PCP, praise, correct, praise. Praise, correct, praise. Yeah, it's a, go. it's a very good uh, teaching mechanism because you say it disarms somebody. Because yeah. that's the other thing when you see, I see in coaching all the time where the, someone's doing something wrong. They go, no, 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 no. Yeah. And then they do the correction. Yeah. And when you hear that, no, you're like, oh, oh my God. I'm an idiot. That's so it's, it's exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Like that's exactly what happens. You yeah. throw the because you get that reaction if you if you initiate with yeah. the no. Um, yeah, you gotta be so. That's why like, coaching is so much more than just showing people moves. People yeah. don't get that, man. They think I'm gonna open a gym. I know a thousand sweeps. I'm good to go. And like, man, that's like one percent of the equation. Yeah, that's why there's yeah. a lot of black belt competitors that are, are terrible coaches. Yeah, because it, it's a it's an art yeah. form in itself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, and you get better at it. It's, get, it's something yeah, to improve yeah. on. Yeah. It's, it's a skill. You have to learn how to teach and whatnot. You know, I think like I learned well because my father was a big time teacher he loved to teach me my brother everything in philosophy and sciences and all yeah. that and then my brother and i in college we tutored a lot of people yeah. and then uh so like kind of came along that stem there were we started learning how to teach good and we also practiced courses and how to teach and all of our instructors learn an instructor training program before they actually become a coach as well so like it's an important skill in itself. Like you said, yeah. it's, it's not just the message. It's how the message is delivered. How you deliver. And I, I, that's the other, the tricky thing is everyone's different too. <laughs> you have to learn your students. And that's such a, that's why it's such an exhausting job. People don't realize how exhausting coaching is because, you know, I, I always make this analogy. Like if you're an accountant and you deal with numbers, right? A seven is always a seven. There's not a morning where number seven wakes up and goes, I feel like a six today. And tomorrow I'm going to feel like an eight. It doesn't happen, right? But people are like that. 
people, they change how they feel about you, how they feel about the gym, how they feel about training, how they feel about the training partners. Their feelings are, there's a lot of moving parts and balancing that all out when you have a lot of students is a, an art form. Like I understand why like gyms have a, they grow to a certain size and then they, they, they start, they, they fragment. They, they, they don't, they don't, it's very hard to keep that cohesiveness after a certain number because there's a tendency for that to happen, especially if you have a lot of high ranking students. I've been a lot better at it over the years to the point where like, I think I, I got to understand what are the pieces that, what is the glue yeah, that, that keep, it yeah, that holds it together. And it, it's not something you, maybe some people have a knack for it, like they have a natural gift for that, that, that social sort of intelligence, but it, it is a skill in itself, man. Like it's, and it's very important to coaching. It's not just when people are coaching, you're not just talking about technique, man. There's a lot of social intelligence that goes that goes and like in, in MMA, for example, I've seen a lot of guys that are called the amazing coaches. You know what they really are? They're good friends with the wife. They're just funny. They're just fun to hang out with. You know, they're just a witty guy who says the right thing at the right time, and they're just cool with the kids. And that's the great coach. It has nothing to do with technique. Yeah. It has nothing to do with actual coaching. But that guy is the amazing coach because he's friends with everyone in the camp, and everyone likes him. I've seen that happen quite a few times to yeah. bad effects because yeah. that. That cool guy that always gives you all the positive affirmation, yeah. gives you, fills your head up with ideas, splits you off from the yeah. camp, and then he's like, oh, now that you lost the actual source of knowledge, yeah. you just have a lot of good feelings, but not yeah. a lot of good fighting skills. And I see people who just torpedo their career after yeah. those type of moves. So yeah, it is, it can be dangerous. And managing a culture, you know, a little society is tricky. It is managing a society. So you're you, act, exactly right. So then when you think about yeah. scale, when we're talking about, you know, several hundred, four or five hundred people maybe under one gym, and then you talk about a city, and then you talk about a country, the levels of stress is just... Imagine, <laughs> I, like, everyone's like, I want to be the next U.S. president. I'm like, I think it's a horrible job. No, man. that's like, not I, a good job. You I can see imagine every, the stress, You can man. see everybody who's gone through it, the aging that happens. Like, oh, dude, Obama like, had white hair like six <laughs> months in office. Yeah, he went from having like, he looked like a 20-year-old. Next thing you know, he looks 50. It's an incredible burden. Yeah. You know what I mean, so like people are like, oh, I, it's a dream job. It's like, no, like those people, regardless about what you care about the ideologies, the amount of work and stress that they're undergoing. Oh, especially if you're the president of the United States, man. It's like, intense. the most important job on the planet, yeah. man. Imagine it, responsibility. Yeah. Uh, Dave, like, I, I want to pick, pick up from this uh, on this coaching topic next time. For sure. Because there is plenty of material there. I think that, um, I think, actually think that coaches will relate more to this conversation than students ever will because students, it's like one of those things. If you've never seen green, you have no idea what green looks like. <laughs> you, you, have to, you, have to, you have to experience it from the inside to know exactly what it's like. And uh, it's a very rewarding but very demanding uh, uh, a job at the same time. Maybe we could have the topic for the next one. For sure. We'll, and um, yeah. Let's do that there. So we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you guys for joining us in our fourth podcast with Breaking the Guard. If you haven't already, make sure you follow us on, on social media for Breaking the Guard on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, we also have our YouTube channel as well. And we're on iTunes now and on the Google Play Store, so you can look us up and subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Thank Take you, care. guys. Until next time.